to invite you to sing, uh, stand and sing our opening song with us today. Good. Good morning, everybody. Are y'all awake now? Yeah. How many of y'all are still sleeping? Because you were here yesterday. Now, here's the deal. I don't give this every week, but this week, you can all take a nap during the sermon. Okay, because here's the deal. Yesterday was crazy out here. How many of y'all were here? Don't raise your hand, all right, because you don't have to confess you weren't. But out here was crazy yesterday, right? And if you were here yesterday, I don't care what you were doing here, and you're tired today, it is a Sabbath. You take a nap. I will not be offended, all right? All right, and I won't know that you weren't here. You can even fake it because there were so many people all over the place. I didn't even see Rebecca while I was here. You know what I'm saying? So um, it was an awesome day. So thanks to all of our amazing volunteers, folks, the church coming together, 
all week long to make yesterday possible. Um, here at Midland, one of the things that we talk about all the time is that there's always another seat at the table. And in our community, we need lots of seats because there's a lot of people around here. And we want to make sure that when we do things like this, we give a chance for everybody to come together because life is truly better that way. And so, so thankful for all the amazing volunteers who made it happen um, this past week. Our men's club, who got the barbecue back on for the first time in almost 10 years, looked like they were doing really well. They sold out of Boston Butts extras they had before we even opened up for the fall festival. So, well done, men. Um, hope they're all getting some sleep today as well. Um, welcome to Midland. If you're uh, here every week, we're so glad you're back another week. Grab hold of a bulletin in your hand this morning, let you know of some of the stuff happening at the church. Also got the amazing QR codes right here. Talk a little bit more about some of them later on, but one of them is to connect. And so if it's just another week for you, scan the QR code, let us know you're here. It's one of the ways we stay connected. If you're a guest with a special welcome to you, we're so glad you're here this morning. Uh, scan that QR code and you'll find a way, place where you can sign in for the first time. Let us know you're here. Uh, share any information you're comfortable sharing with us because we'd love to connect with you and your family as well. If you don't do QR codes, that's okay. We have some amazing, amazing little connection cards right there in the backs of the chairs. Grab one of those, fill it out this morning. Let us know you're here. Take a moment, look at some folks around you, tell them good morning. We're going to keep on rolling.
Each morning we take uh, this time to kind of pray together. So I'm going to invite you to have a seat this morning. One of the things we know is that as life comes our way, one of the best things to always be aware of is uh, we're not alone in it. For us, we understand to be always present with us, no matter where we are or what's going on. God is right there alongside us. And one of the things I love so much about being church is that we get a chance to represent God's presence with others by the way we live and love alongside one another. And so we bring it all to God together this morning in prayer. We'll have a moment where it's a little quiet. We'll pass the offering plates for you to drop in connection cards and offering this morning. But this is a time of reflecting and bringing it before God. Let's pray. Guys, we bring it before you this morning. We're trusting that you are at work in the best of times and in the worst of times. God, in the moments of celebration and in the moments, God, where we're wondering if there's anything worth celebrating, you are at work. So this morning, we bring before you, God, all the words of praise about who you are. And we also bring before you, God, all the things that we know we can't handle alone, trusting that you're at work even though. So God, we ask you to hear our prayers in these moments. And we ask you to take this offering this morning. God, bless the gifts that are given and use them to make your kingdom known more and more in the world all around us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Are you tricking me right now? No, I was trying to something to Oh! See, this is the time where I'm used to Rebecca interrupting all that's going on. You know, and then she was quiet this week, so I was wondering. <laughs> yesterday. Yeah. Oh, how many of you went home with way too much candy? Oh, yeah, I got some hands. I got some hands. Some of you owning that. Some of you said it wasn't an, you got a, you got too much, Jane? Oh, okay. Oh my. Hey, I have another question. How many of you are going to get more candy on Tuesday? Yep, moms and dads, I'm sorry in advance, not really. <laughs> you went on the bouncy house? How many of you played on the bouncy houses? Yeah. How many of you played some games? Yeah. Did any of you throw some, some awesome axe throwing down there? Oh, we like the axe throwing. And you pop balloons with darts? That's yeah, that's pretty awesome. Ooh, yeah, that's how they blow balloons up. You're right. All right, how many of y'all are ready to say good morning? Not that you're obviously not awake. Hold on. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> we have had our candy fill. All right, y'all. So hold on. Hold your thought for me just a minute. You can tell me in the hallway because otherwise we are never going to get through this. How many of you all know a really hard word named tabernacle? Listen, preacher's kid. <laughs> Show off. <laughs> he said he's already read the story. He's, um, I guess he's going to go teach it. Whoever's in his, Rachel, girl, 
Good luck. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go read a story. Do you know who God gave the rules to build the tabernacle to? Who? Moses, I'm so proud of you all. Give yourselves a pat on the back. We've been reading lots of stories about Moses, that's right, and about our Israelite friends that have been wandering around in the desert. I see you have a rocket on your shirt. It's just like wandering. So we're going to go and read a story about a tabernacle and all the special things that they used to read to build the tabernacle. Listen, we have gone down a rabbit hole up here, y'all, and they need me to look at their clothes. A tabernacle. Can y'all say that with me? Tabernacle. That's pretty awesome. Let's say a prayer um, and maybe one for the teachers too because y'all are going to have more candy too. All right, come on. Dear God. Thank you. Thank you. For helping me. Thank you. For guiding me. For guiding me. And for leading me. And for leading me. Amen. Amen. Yep. Hi, darling. Here we go. Woo. They got energy. How many of us are like going, please share right now? You know? It's the candy, in case you're wondering. It's the candy. So if you need some energy, uh, you know, go get some candy. We're so grateful for our amazing volunteers. Um, if uh, you volunteer and are part of our children's ministry, thank you so much for what you do. Um, we're so grateful for uh, the folks here at the church who make it a priority to help kids understand that they are not just the future of the church. They are the church right now, um, and they already have a role to play, and that matters to us a lot here at Midland. A couple of more announcements, like things I just want to make sure you're aware of. We have some really fun stuff uh, coming up here at the church, and I'm just asking Emma Kate to like, guide me through to make sure I hit them all this morning. Um, and so we have our kids' Christmas musical going on. And uh, if you're not familiar with how this works, on Wednesday nights at 5.30, we have a dinner in here for all the kids to come in and eat. So if you need a night of not having to cook or find food, uh, Wednesday night here at the church is great for your kids. Bring them up here. Uh, we eat some dinner right there in the back and then head upstairs and uh, get a chance to work on the Christmas play. So this is learning the Christmas songs and some little speaking parts that get to come in there. And so that's at 5.30, get started, finishes up at 7 o'clock. Um, on Wednesday nights. And the really cool part is this leads into our Christmas dinner as well. Now, if you've never been here for a Christmas dinner, you got to give it a shot. Uh, it's great. We have reservations available now. Last year, I think our reservations, I think our number is 160 something, 164 or something like that. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this space right here, but tables and chairs for 164 people is really, really impossible, actually. Um, and so we had some people that I said, I'm just going to pick up some food and sit in a chair. And this year, what we decided to do is book it on this date right here. You see December uh, the 13th. That's a Wednesday night. And then we have, if you sign up, you can go on there right now. Scan the QR code, look on there on the connection card stuff. Um, you can sign up and tell us if you're available on another night of the week. And so if we get too full too fast, then we're going to see if we can't book it on another night of the week that people are also available. Does that kind of make sense to you out there? So that everyone who wants a chance to come in and see the amazing performance can. Um, and so that's what we're working towards. Uh, we're also asking families to double book for kid play, so you make sure you love on them and give them hugs regularly um, if, we're, if we end up doing that. But this is what we're looking at uh, to create space to enjoy a Christmas dinner together. Uh, there you go. You cost $15 adults, $6 for kids, a max of $45 a family. So if you're a big family, you're covered. It's all right. $45 covers all the meal and everything. Catered in, delicious food um, with dessert and drinks all included. Now, before then, there's a free meal that we invite everybody to as well. This is our Thanksgiving dinner. How many of y'all have ever been to Thanksgiving dinner here? Yeah, this is fun. This is where you cook up whatever your favorite part of the Thanksgiving dinner is. Your favorite casserole, your favorite Publix chicken, you know, whatever you want. And you bring that 
here and we have a table that runs the entire length of this room and we fill it up with good food and then we all go through and we feast together around the tables um, that evening. It is a lot of fun. It is very fun being a country church still, even though we're in the suburbs of just the good old country cooking and enjoying time together. So you fix up your favorite Thanksgiving uh, part of the meal, bring it up here. Uh, there is no requirement on what you bring. Okay, so we've told people before, if we don't have meat, we enjoy all the casseroles, all right? Church won't provide anything on that night except for some drinks in the back, so you bring what you love. We also have on that evening uh, our women's ministry auction, which we are very confident that God loves that idea, all right? Um, all the money from the cake auction goes into our women's ministry and the work they do to impact lives throughout our community. It is absolutely delicious cake. If you're going, I need a cake for Thanksgiving, be here and get you a cake. Your money goes directly all of it to the women's ministry. Uh, to impact the lives here at the church and throughout our community. Really fun, a lot of good times here. Um, and that is on November 15th, just a few weeks away now. All right, what else we got in the cake? Make sure I got them all. Giving, yes, that's the other one you can scan today. So one of the things that we have here at the church is uh, a budget, and we try to be very responsible. In November, we will meet together with uh, the church council leadership of the church to set up next year's budget. And one of the things that's very helpful is kind of to know an idea of what's expected for next year on income. So this is not something where we send you a message, you know, every month saying, hey, you're behind or, hey, thank you for being ahead. This is something that just gives us a way to look at how we set up uh, plans for next year. And so uh, if this is something you do every year, you're used to kind of giving to the church, if you can let us know what your plans look like for next year, it's a huge help as we set the budget for the upcoming year. Like I said, it's nothing where we call you out on like, why aren't you doing what you said? It just helps us plan well. So that's one of the QR codes you'll see on the bulletin this morning. And is there anything else? There's where you can text to give. Anything else I got, Kate? Am I good? Oh, yeah. Up Connect. That one is really cool. So we have a huge QR code. If you haven't like, gone through the connection card, huge QR code, you can scan it from your seat. If you're like, I don't pick up bulletins because I like to save paper. Um, I love trees, and that's a good thing to love trees. You can scan it off the screen right there. Do it quick. Got it? I don't see any other phones moving right now. All right, we're good. All right, okay. So let's get started here. Now, second week of a series looking at this idea of, uh, of options in life, of choices that have to be made, and it is titled, I Choose to Look at All the Things that We Choose. Um, this, is, this is an important thing because if, if you know anything about life, we all have decisions to make, don't we? We all have decisions to make. How many of you love to make the decisions in life? Nobody here does. How many of you fear having to make another decision regularly? Oh, good, thank goodness. I was like, man, they are all sleeping, which is fine. I told you you can sleep. I just didn't know you sleep with your eyes open. It just made me feel weird. You know? Yeah, yeah. So some of us, we all have decisions to make. Some of us love to make a decision. Some of us run from decisions. Uh, but here's something that I have found to be so true in life is that to choose not to choose is a decision in and of itself. How many of you all know that's true? To choose not to choose, you've already made the decision. Don't ever say, well, I don't have to choose. You've already chosen, right? And this is the hard part. This is one of those parts of life that there's no escaping. There's no, you can get out of it. It is always going to be there. It's going to follow you everywhere you go. You will have to make decisions. You will have to make a choice. Sometimes you have great options on the table to choose between. And sometimes you're like, I have no good options on the table. And yet I still have to choose. And so we're working through this. And the way we're working through it is, is looking at it through the eyes of who we are as a church here at Midland. Now, if you're familiar with us, we talk about being a family at Midland. We love being the fact that we have been a smaller church for 135 years, not because we're small and we don't want more people. It's because we think that we can create a family environment where you bring your family and we form one big family together. The deal is at Midland, as we talk about what it means to be a family, we are a growing family because we don't think we have it and we don't think at any point we will earn the right to limit the kingdom of God. And so as we have grown through these past years now, we've been saying, how is it that we make sure we remain a family living life alongside one another and always having another seat at the table for someone to join us? And one of the ways this works is through our membership covenant. We don't like to call it, you know, this is what you got to agree to to be a member as much as this life together in a covenant. Now, how many of y'all love being a member of something? I've found that some people love memberships, right? And they'll tell you about all of their memberships, and they will even pay high dollars to get members. You ever seen this before? Come on, go with me some of our civic organizations. You know what your dues are to be a member. You know what you're saying, right? You pay some high money so you can get to be a member. And we love it, 
right? And as we talked about last week, the members only jackets that we like to wear around, they're great. At least when I was a kid, they were great. Me and Pop wore them together all the time, and so it was good. And then you have other people who go, as soon as you begin to talk about membership, they're like drawing a line, I do not do that. Let me say right now, don't ever ask me to be a member of your club. I don't care to be a part of your club at all, all right? I know how this works. You're trying to get me stuck into something, and then I'm stuck there, and I'm going, what? And you're like, well, you said so when you became a member, and I'm not playing that game. And then we got others like, I didn't know I had to do anything different. You know, I have a story of one of our families. It's great. I have more than one story, but one of them's hilarious, and, and, and he's here this morning, and I'm not going to look at him right now, all right? But I can totally remember when the family came up to me and said, hey, we want to join the church, right? And said, I didn't know we had to do anything else. We've been coming. I thought we were already members, right? And I'm like, oh, no, we got to bring you up in front of everybody and embarrass you before you can be a member of this congregation, right? Remember that, don't you? You remember that. Yes, you do. I know. That's, that's right. That's right. That's right. It's so good. I love it. And I've had several families. I thought we were members, you know. We have one of our families that's you know, been here for several years now and still looks at me and like, what does that mean? You know, I'm like, it's good. So what we're doing is we're taking this idea of the options and the choices we have in life, and we're putting them within the context of what does it mean to be a part of this life together at Midland. And so this is not some way of me going, now at the end of the series, I want to make sure we have everybody here join the church. You're always welcome to join the church. And I want you to know there's always a place for you at the table, and there's always a place for you to become an official member of the church. That's not the win for me. The win for me in this series, the reason we're doing it is I want you to know what we're really about as a congregation and why I think it matters. Now, there's two requirements to become a quote-unquote member of the church. The first is baptism. Now, how many of y'all know anything about baptism? You can be baptized in lots of different ways. Here at Midland, you can be sprinkled, you can be poured on, or you can be dunked. Here at Midland, you can be sprinkled, poured on, or dunked at any other church And we still take that as baptism. You've been baptized somewhere. Any Christian church where you've been baptized counts because in in our tradition, we don't believe that baptism is something that you finally got right or that you had a real pastor get it right. We believe it's all about what God does in that moment. It's the initiation into faith. And so that's why we're okay with whenever you've been baptized in a Christian church, it counts for us here at Midland. And then the second part is this. It's the membership covenant. Here's how it reads, if you've never heard it before. Will you faithfully participate in our ministries here at Midland by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And you may say, what in the world does that mean? And that's a great question. And that's what we're spending this time looking at. And as I've said before, this isn't just trying to nail down if you really want to be a member here. It's also saying we think that if you put this into life for you and your family, it has tremendous payoff as well. And that first part we talked about last week, what do you think it was that we talked about last week? Prayers, very good. If you weren't here, you can cheat because we're going to go in order. Prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Got that one? Yeah, I know. It's good. All right. So here's what we said last week. When we talk about prayers in life, we said uncertainty fuels anxiety. When you don't know and you're not sure, you get anxious, don't you? Some of us get more anxious than others. Uncertainty fuels anxiety. Anxiety, And when you begin to look at this in light of who we are as people of faith, the great question to ask as uncertainty comes our way, as anxiety comes our way, is who is your God? And and we looked at it like this. As as we asked the question, who is your God, we we didn't put it up there in some way of like, you know, is your God money? Is your God your hobbies? It wasn't any of that stuff because, uh, you know, that's a good sermon on, on another day. This one was all about, as you think about the one true God, who is your capital G God? As we begin to look at it, we talked about how people approach prayer. And, and there's people that, uh, some, a really fun article that was written that talked about this in a way that said, people have a secure attachment to God. In other words, when they go to God in prayer, they bring everything they've got before God, knowing good and well what they got is what they got. And who they are is who they are. They're not trying to impress God. They're not trying to coax God. They're just bringing whatever's on their heart before God. And they have the ability to end their time of prayer, much like Jesus said in his time with the disciples, But God, you know best, your kingdom come, your will be done. And we said, this is such a tough part for some of us. But those who had the secure attachment to God, trusting God is at work for the good, had this ability to bring it before God, pour out their hearts, and then say, but God, you know best. And then there's this other group of us, and this is where I I find myself quite oftentimes. You know, I fall into the uh, the anxious attachment to God, right? And I come to God, and uh, I've usually been working on it for a while, and, and I say, hey, God, um, please help me with, and I kind of fill in my blank of whatever's going on in life, and then I begin to explain to God how he can help me. Anybody with me on this one? 
I, I, I bring things before God if families ask me to pray for them, and I begin to tell God what he needs to do for this family. Y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm like, God, here, just some pointers for you. I know you're God and all, but, you know, I've been thinking about it, and here's kind of some things you should really look into, you know. And they talked about this idea of an anxious presence where, for some reason or another, we, we want to say, God, your will be done, but we, we don't want to. That we want to trust that God's going to do great things, but we're not really sure on this issue. And it doesn't make us bad people. That's a good thing. It just ruins that opportunity for the hope that I think is offered for us. The anxiety overwhelms us because uncertainty fuels anxiety in life. And so we ask that question, who is your God? And is your God worth trusting? Because that's what our faith in. As we ended the day, it's a chance for you to reflect. We said, who? Bam! Who your God is matters when you pray. Who your God is matters. If you want to hear more about it, you're welcome to go kind of pull up. Last week, you can hear the different kind of ways we talked about how we look at God. And this week, I want to ask a great question for you. Who has been at this place before? The phone call, the text that sounds just like this. Where are you? Anybody? Who has to send that text regularly? Who has to make that call regularly around here? Where are you at? What is going on? You were supposed to be home 15 minutes ago. Do you have teenagers in your house yet? No? Okay, good. Did you already raise some of those and they're out and moved on somewhere else? Yes, good for you. How many of y'all still have to do this, right? How many of you find yourself with this question constantly, where are you at? What is going on? You hear the background sound in the conversation, where are you at, huh? Anybody? No? Y'all look at me this morning. I'm glad y'all rest. Where are you? Where are you? Now, the funny part of this is as I was reading through and looking at it, in the church world, we think being together is important, as we've said plenty of times. Presence matters. And and I wanted to look at this idea of excuses that come up. Now, there's always the common excuses that you hear. There's the ones that go something like, I don't want to be with hypocrites, right? And I'm like, oh, sorry, bud. Anywhere you go, you are hanging out with hypocrites. We all mess it up, do we not? Right? And so even in the church, it doesn't change. You're still going to have folks that we're trying and we still mess it up. All right, so people give that excuse. Some people are like, it's beautiful outside, I'm playing around to golf. And I'm like, okay, very good for you. Golf anytime you want, and that's a good, make sure you do it on Sunday mornings right around this time. Some people are hunting, and that's really good this time of year. It's a great thing uh, to be doing. And that's where you really encounter God is in the tree, and all that's perfectly fine. But those are the sorry excuses that we've heard too many times. I want to give you some real excuses this morning. Okay? A little research was done. Uh, a guy named... Tom Rainer, who works, he works at Lifeway with the big organization side of it, did some of this research. He now has his own organization. But he said, these are some responses that I got from pastors that they had been told. Both of my girlfriends attend church there. And that is sometimes a problem. Um, this was another one. It's pretty good. The worship leader pulls his pants, pulls up his pants too often because they're exercising, I'm sure. And it's distracting. Y'all ever have that happen? Come to 9.30, it's much better. I wear a robe, so does our choir. So there's not many people up front trying to pull their drawers up very often, all right? So someone called me brother instead of using my name. Let me say something, brother. I can't remember everybody's name all the time, all right? So we do our best. But somebody's probably going to call you something else, all right, on accident, all right? That's kind of how it goes. But my kids take nap during that time. You ever heard that excuse? Yeah, so Sorry. But it's true. But it's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. Kids take natural time. My wife cooked bacon for breakfast, and our entire family smelled like bacon. And that's a real one. That's a real one. We do not want to be, you know, in any way get in the way of people worshiping because they're just distracted by the smell and their digestive system start working, you know, that kind of thing. It's good. It's loving others. I always get hemorrhoids on Sunday mornings. That's a real problem. But, but I feel like I feel like that's a problem solved. You know, you got like, there's something that's probably happening on Friday or Saturday that's causing that. You know, <laughs> gas prices are too high. Eh, go on and on, right? We heard that one. The church is too close to drive and too far to walk. I just want to know who said that. You know, who said that? Who looked at their pastor and said, you know, last two are really good ones. Last two are really good is looking on the pastor side of it, because pastors can get in the way, and I get that. These last two are all kind of looking at where the pastor can get in the way. The pastor stays in the Bible too much, and that can be a problem. You know, like, who in the world wants to waste their time reading over this stuff anyway? The last was kind of one of the things we're dealing with at Midland quite often, and y'all may have heard this one before, and um, we're we're trying to find out the best way to kind of deal with it. But um, when when people call in and and tell Wendy that um, the pastor is too attractive... (laughs) Ever. <laughs>
<laughs> that is so true. <laughs> I love that, you know? That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. The excuses we come up with in life. I'm so glad when he's here on Sunday mornings. This is my boy Jay, by the way. <laughs> when you begin to look at the excuses that we have, the excuses that we come up with in life, you know, there's this, we think about all these excuses and people have them for why they don't go to church. We have them for why we don't do this. We, we have them for why we're not doing this or why we always are doing these things in life. We have our excuses that we've come up with, these things that, that we say. And here's the deal. When it all comes down to our excuses, time is one thing you can't get back and you can't get more. And when we come to our excuses in life, one of the things that's been so helpful for me, as I heard someone else say, is every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to a whole host of other things. And this idea of time is one thing you can't get back and you can't get more. What are we saying yes to in life? And one of the ways we begin to think about it and look at our schedules, look at our excuses, the things that we say is we do this. When you realize time is limited, our priorities will change. Y'all ever been there before? When you realize time is limited, this is like the midlife crisis time when you overcome your crazy part and you look back and go, man, I wish I would have spent more time with this, right? Or as we've said it here many times before, presence indicates priority. And this is the one that sticks with us as we go through life. Presence indicates priority. There's a rabbi, um, and he has a quote that I have read to y'all. So it's years back now. But I think it's a really good quote that I want to read to you before we start into the passage of Scripture this morning. This is a, a rabbi that's pretty well known from what I best understand. And uh, in one of the books he wrote, he said, Quality time was an idea invented by harried and overworked parents to mitigate the phenomenal guilt they felt in neglecting their children. Quality time. We talk about quality time. I'm spending quality time. I'm spending quality time with my family. Quality time is nothing but a poor excuse used by parents who cannot give their children the great gift of quantity time. And our world's so busy, and our world's so crazy, and we have so much going on all the time. And it becomes, how many of y'all with me? It becomes so hard. It's like, what am I supposed to do right now? And you're just literally, your mind is racing. And you're like, I, I know if I, if I say yes to this, then I'm not going to be able to do these things. But I, I mean, if I don't do this, then how am I going to be able to do these things? And how am I really showing love to the people I love most in my family? Because if I say yes to this, I can't do this with this part of my family. And if I say yes to this, I can't do this with this part. And we just feel so strong out and overwhelmed. Anybody been there with me before? So our question this morning to read this text is this. What must we do to get our priorities right and keep them in order? Now, I'm not someone who thinks I have it all figured out, but there's a passage of Scripture. We're just going to read a few verses this morning that I hope will shine some light for you as you begin to look at life and priorities as we talk about what it means to truly be present when we're around. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Now, how many of y'all know a little bit? Quick, quick, quick. Hebrews, we don't know exactly who wrote it. There's lots of guests who wrote Hebrews. We don't really know for sure, but we do know that the author of Hebrews is bringing some of what we would call our Old Testament writing, the Hebrew Bible writing, and putting it now in light of Jesus. And the very interesting thing is, as the, the writer goes through and recounts the great stories of the great people who have come before, each time it comes down to, wasn't this amazing, and yet it wasn't enough. And we'll talk about the faith of the people and all this great stuff that had happened, and these laws that had been put in place. And it weren't these great laws to help us understand, and yet it still wasn't enough. And at the end, the enough comes back to who? Jesus. And that's the whole working of this book in Hebrews. And in chapter 10, we read these words, let us hold unswervingly, sorry, you can go back. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Unswervingly. Now, how many of y'all know anything about swerving? How many of y'all have ever had to be somebody learning to drive and swerving, right? You know where you're going, and yet you get to swerve on. And this is life for most of us, right? I'm trying to get here, but to get there, I'm sometimes making good decisions, sometimes not the best, right? And there's a swerving. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope. One of my favorite things about faith is that along with faith comes hope. This hope that we profess. And where does this hope come from? For he who promised is faithful. And that's a very encouraging part for me. 
Because before you read into anything else, when it comes to my priorities and me, quote unquote, getting it right, I love how in Hebrews it starts by saying, by the way, it's not sitting on your shoulders alone. This is not all about how you're going to get it right. Let's start with the hope that we're going to hold to. It's not about how you're going to finally get your priorities in order. You're finally going to have your life in order. You're finally going to do the right things. But it's for he who promised to be faithful, that we have a faithful God who is always at work, even as we're struggling to get it all in order. That's a great way to start this talk for those of us who feel like I just can't figure it out right now. So in light of this, in light of us holding unswervingly to the hope that not that I'm finally going to figure it out, but that then he who made the promise is faithful. In light of that, let us consider how we may spur one another on. And here it comes. When you begin to talk about your priorities and how you're going to get it right, it's not just you, it's us. And I love this part again, where it's all about what God has done on our behalf through this man named Jesus Christ. And then this next part is not about me finally figuring it all out, but it's about us being in it together. And let us consider how we may spur one another on. I love spurring people on, too, because I always think of cowboy boots. You know what I'm talking about? Spurring things on. That's good. And some people need a real strong kicking sometimes, don't they? But this idea is what? To make sure we are moving through life together, that we're not stalling out and we're not missing it, right? This is good. Spur one another on. The next part toward love and good deeds. So as we are moving and as we are encouraging one another, as we are maybe sometimes kicking one another a little bit, where are we moving towards again here? Love and good deeds. This is where we move towards. We talk about priorities and how am I going to get it in line and how am I going to live up to it, how am I going to experience life to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up, and I love this part for us today, and this is where we're focusing. Not giving up on doing what? Meeting together. Presence indicates priority. And whether you want to view this through what it is to be church today, this is great. If you want to view this through what it means to be family today, this is great. If you want to view this through what it means for you to have maybe a successful office, all right, this is probably still really good. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. The question becomes, who are you meeting with, right? Because who you're with, presence indicates priority. So let's not give up meeting each other. Some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And when we're together, encouraging one another. And all the more, as you see the day approaching. Obviously, obviously, this isn't a new problem. Obviously, it's not a new thing that people get really excited and pumped about one part of life and invest a lot of time and energy and what they got in it. And then at some point go, all right, that's enough. And then move to something else and go, oh, this is great. And obviously, this is something that's been going on for a long time. And in the midst of all that, this is great. And I can't wait for it. This is going to be amazing. All of that, there's this place that we hold to in the midst of it all. And obviously, back in the day, people struggled to stay on it. And we know we struggle today. We are easily distracted. Let us hold tight to, right, this hope that we profess. Gathering together, spurring one another on. So here are the three, and we're closing it down here. This teaching that we have before us today, to spur one another on. We're in it together. There's more to come. This next part comes in, to not give up meeting together, present with one another. And as we get together, And if you want to define what does it mean to spur one another on, to make sure that we are continuing to move together, we do this through encouraging one another. As you begin to look at life, you begin to think about it, you see what's going on, and we want to talk about priorities. Here at Midland, when we come together as a church and we invite you into the covenant, we say, will you participate in the ministries with your prayers and your presence? And the reason why is because in life, presence indicates priority. And so where are you present right now? Where are you spending your time? That's how you can know where your priorities lie. So we close up this morning. It's just kind of a a thing to kind of think about and reflect on this upcoming week. 
There's a lot going on. This is a busy time of year. I'm so excited to have like 35 slides I have to go through to do announcements for you. That means there's good stuff happening. And yet it's so difficult sometime in the midst of it all to nail it down. So before you, presence indicates priority. Where are you investing your time? Where are you present? Let's pray. God, in the midst of all the great work that you do and the life we're called to, excuses can come our way and God to in some way justify, make ourselves maybe even feel a little bit better. We can come up with our own excuses and yet miss out on the opportunity God, to overcome the busyness that's bound to come our way in life. To come to a place where we can be encouraged and spurred on toward life to the fullest. And so, God, as we begin to look at all that life has for us, all that's coming our way, the expectations we have, may we find a way to truly be present in life. God, we know there's such a difference between being there and being present. God, as we show up and as we are together, may we be present with one another. And God, as we spend time with friends and with family, may we truly be present with one another. And as we do these things, God, may we see the great life that you have created us for. God, get the glimpses of what it means to be your people and to see your kingdom come in the here and now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to your feet this morning as we close in this time.
forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and communion in the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. See y'all next week.